So my my partner and I looked into um, improving the whole model by aligning the super design. It's uh, specifically the one where it's interesting information. Um, so in a nutshell, here's the problem. So consider these two proteins here. Obviously, they have very similar structures. Um, and in terms of function, they're also very similar because the one on the left is a liable protein and the one on the right is a smooth um, But their sequence identity is extremely small. Here is only 60%. Unless you get one is from an elephant and one is from an eggfish. Um, and so like, this poses a great challenge because oftentimes we don't have the structure. We just have the sequence. And detecting this type of remote homology is very challenging for allow this uh, purely alignment based on this. Um, so in terms of the tools we have out there right now, there's like class, which does sequence sequence alignment. Um, and then we have SciBlast, which builds a multiple uh, sequence alignment profile, including the alignment. And then we have like Hammer, which does like HMS profile. And in terms of the uh, homology detection efficacy, we see an increase as we align higher abstractions. So now the question is, is there another form of sequence abstraction that we can align that would be even better in terms of detection? Um, and we think the answer is yes, and we built a tool around it. We call it EPOD. It's used as you can name. I can't think of anything else. Um, but, uh, but basically, we built a tool. It's just like the other alignment methods out there. It takes in a query sequence and outputs a list of pairs. Um, but the the difference here is we're aligning the sequence embedding rather than the sequence system itself. And I'll talk about what the embedding what, what the embeddings are. Um, but before you fall asleep, here's the punchline. Um, it seems like DPOD does a lot better than the other methods out there, at least in terms of the zip code benchmark. Um, so let's dive right in. So what are these sequence embeddings? Um, so what I'm showing you here is actually published last year by this uh, by Beppler et al. Um, what they did is they borrowed, they borrowed um, inspiration from natural language processing, where they built a bi bidirectional LSTM model that takes in protein sequences and outputs embeddings. And how they did that is, they, is that they took the bidirectional LSTM network and attached uh, global structural predictions as their end. And so the model is trained on these global structural predictions. And after training, they threw away these tasks, and what they're left with is an encoder that takes in protein sequences and outputs and embedding vectors. And the idea is because these vectors are learned on uh, global structural predictions, um, these embeddings actually impose some sort of structural pitch. And they, and they show that in the paper and we can draw a cool to it. And we looked at this and we're like, all right, why stop there? Let's include local structural tasks in there because in terms of alignment, we might want to find pockets of the proteins that are homologous, not like globally and entire proteins. Um, so we, we try to add in that, and in the interest of time, we're not going to talk about the details of that local structure in the past. Um, it's actually really cool, but if I have time, I'll talk about it. Um, but due to the time and hardware constraints, we actually we originally wanted to train the whole model, but we didn't have time, and the whole model didn't put in a GPU. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and training on a CPU would take like, I think, 80 days, and we didn't have that many days. Um, and so what we did instead is we took um, this previous model, the weights, we just attach our local structural prediction network at the end, load the weights, read that we can accept the embeddings layer and our task, and then just fine tune the model that way. Um, but again, we only had CPUs, so we only fine tune it for 18 epochs. Um, I'll show you the results later. Uh, but so here's the full epoch overview. So as I said, there's like the alignment tool that takes in a query sequence, and then the encoder is the some sort of embedding encoder that we talked about earlier. So we tried both the vector and encoder as well as when we tried to fine tune it. Um, and then what comes out of it is a list of bits with key values. And we calculated the key values by fitting some sort of confusion codes. Um, and then in terms of the alignment algorithm, we, we use the modified Smith-Waterman local alignment algorithm, where the gap limit is zero, but instead of plus or minus one match and mismatch, we have vectors, so we have to close um, so how do we evaluate this this uh, this tool? Um, so in terms of benchmark data sets, a lot of people use SCOP, which is the structural classification of proteins database, to evaluate protein homology detection models. Um, so what we did is we took that uh, so that database basically consists of proteins that are classified by fold, class, superfamily, family, etc. And these are all structural class classification and not by sequence. And so, and a lot of these are manually annotated. So, what we did is we 
took this benchmark data set, we took out all the sequences that we used to train our model, so that we, we kept only the sequences that have not seen by our model, and then we filtered out everything that has greater than 30% sequence event, just to make, just to make the problem more, more realistic, to kind of the problem more detection. Um, so what we're left with is 530, 33 total sequences, and on the order of like 100,000 pairs. So like we paired the protein, some pairs are homologous. Um, so here's the RLC curve of the same table I showed you from the, from the beginning. Um, so it's basically P pot plus some sort of embedding, either the one from Beckler or the one from ours, um, has like around 0.88 AUC uh, score. Whereas blast, side blast, and hammer is like 100%. Um, and recall, we're using a data set where the sequence then is less than that. That makes sense. Um, and, and if you just look at the numbers, the, the one using Beckler at all is like 0.8785. You see, ours is like 0.8798, it's a little bit, a little better. Mm -hmm. uh, but it might be with the margin of error. But again, you just fine tune for 18. So it could be better if we had more time and more hardware resources. Um, and then we also looked into just p value threshold because these AUC scores are calculated from uh, taking a p value and assigning that as a probability of topology. But in practice, what people want to do is just take a cutoff. So, like, oh, we, we just consider all, this, all the alignments with less than 0.05 p value as homologous to the rest of the time. So, we did this kind of binary threshold, and we also find that. Our embedding still yield, so, so like, let's say if you take a p value of 0.05, the AUC is still like 0.85, using um, p value. So that's pretty good news. And then we also try to investigate why these embeddings work so well. So we did a UMAC plot of, UMAC plot of these protein sequences. Again, these sequences are not seen by our model. And then we colored them by the Scott classes. So the plot on the left, we have, um, you know, uh, Basically, the embeddings in UMAP um, colored by the Scott class, you have alpha beta, membrane protein, small protein, and whatnot, and you see these sort of uptrend naturally. Um, and then the, the plot on the right is the same embedding spot, except colored by SOP superbase, which is what we're interested in in terms of the monologue detection. And we see that within the Scott class of the panel to see, but you also see super band, super family cluster within these Scott classes. Um, so that explains why we thought it was so well. Um, so in conclusion, we think that, yeah, I mean, we, can, we can align sequence embeddings and that's something that's very well. Um, and things we can try again, we should try fine-tuning our model with that extra little prediction pass at that point, just to see if we can squeeze more um, detection efficacy out of it. And we, all, we can also explore a, attaching other tasks to it to include more information in embeddings, such like as evolutionary information, or we do like a side blast profile and stuff like that. Like that. There are many things we can try. And then um, PPOT is currently a fully functional Python package. Theory people can use it, except the limitation is it's very slow. Um, but there are, you know, if we have more time, we could try parallelizing and employing like heuristics with like class to, uh, to find things to go that way. Um, and then like these embeddings are very useful for other machine learning tasks, like CQs and for structure prediction tasks like the interest. For example, like the drug. Just, uh, the project that we're doing. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, questions? <laughs> wow. Um, <laughs> this is pretty amazing. So, um, I have, uh, I mean, there's all kinds of things that you can do now. I mean, uh, sort of what you're saying about tertiary structure prediction. I mean, in a way, I feel there's a whole field that dramatically is limited by not having this kind of tool. So now you can basically start going way out there. And in terms of the super family class, if you go back one slide, there's some sort of thing that I see scattered across multiple places. Are these just different super families? Um, or is it just that you have way too many colors? Oh, no, yeah, no. So these are, there are too many super families, so the colors actually cycle. Oh, I see. So I see. Uh, <laughs> okay. So it's not a lack of clustering. It's really just that there's a lot of many colors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. But, but basically, <laughs> what I'm curious about is if you could now somehow push the limits of super family detection by sort of having these embeddings, you can now start redefining the classes and basically saying. So we are actually doing a super family. So 
we consider a pair no, 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 what I'm trying to say is that the current annotations are only go so far. Yeah. And my question is, could you go further? Can you have somehow push the limits of what people have been able to recognize before by saying, hey, why don't you consider this candidate as well? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. That's possible. Awesome. Yeah, you should, you should reach out to these people and basically say, hey, we have a tools too. <laughs> I, I mean, you should obviously publish it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm happy to chat afterwards about sort of what, you know, next steps remain before actually coming off the table. Okay. I think you're very, very close to that. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Thanks.